We are three quarters of the way through North Africa week. And of course, I enjoy all my shows, but I'm particularly looking forward to this one because it, the Irish Brigade uh, was something I read about a lot when I was a teenager because my great uncle, who was in the Royal Ulster Rifles in Normandy, post-war was in the London Irish Rifles Territorial Army in London. And so he knew a lot of the people who'd been in the London Irish in World War II. So I had an original kind of regimental history of the London Irish Rifles years ago, and it was something I read about. So I've been looking forward to tonight's show. So, um, and just to remind you, as usual, folks, don't forget to consider becoming a patron so we can keep these shows coming at you. Check out what we're doing on Twitter. Check out what we're doing on Facebook. The link to my guest's incredible website about the Irish Brigade is in the description below. And not only has is there a wealth of information on the website, he has his own YouTube channel with films from the battlefield so you can take what we're doing today and go on and explore to a greater depth via there so i'm getting getting that plug in straight away but right now it means me to introduce my guest uh, Evan o'sullivan so uh, good evening sir how are you doing today very well paul thank you very much for inviting me this evening and we're happy to ha have you and uh, you know like i just mentioned my great uncle there your whole interest in the irish brigade is an incredibly deep family connection your father wasn't just part of the of the brigade he was you know a, a sergeant major at one point so integral without him yeah, the unit doesn't exist because everybody knows the sergeant majors and ncos are the backbone of the british army so tell us a little bit before we start the presentation about your father and what he did yeah my father was of irish descent his um, gra uh, great grandfather had come from ireland and from the famine and he settled in London, and so all his family were of Irish descent, but they were Londoners. And in 1939, the last thing that my dad was going to do was uh, was going to be in the army. But he was conscripted in uh, October 1939, and like uh, thousands of other 20-year-olds, because that was the age group that was uh, caught was being recruited, he was allocated a regiment. And he can only conclude that someone was going through the list and said, "Oh, Sullivan Irish, and then we put him in the London Irish Rifles." which is, was then a territorial uh, or reserve formation based in Ch Chelsea Barracks, uh, Duke of York Barracks. He was really quite an elite uh, body. Mm. And he went into the second battalion, which was formed. And, and that's the connection. And he, he did, of course, uh, he, he was made sergeant within about two years. So he was probably really quick. He was well educated and he was made color sergeant. And then in the campaign from November 1942, all the way through until May 45, he was in theater. Um, as color sergeant in a company, and he saw the lot. And, so, and this is that you know people are already saying there. Yeah, that's not much of a Cork accent there, Eddie. But you know when we think of Scottish units in World War Two or Irish or Welsh, and of course there's a core part of all of those units that has that heritage. Of course it was conscription. So you know you take a unit like the Welsh Guards in 1945. There'd be guys from Newcastle, guys from Glasgow. That's just how it was. But of course. Yeah strong links to the heritage and and i think one of the things living in france and i will get into the presentation in a minute is that because the french refer to the english language they refer to british people as les anglais the english and it's so they'll talk about the english landing beaches and and my friend colin who's irish will always politely and sometimes not politely if it's someone he knows who should know better remind people no no british yeah the british is all of these elements and not just the British, you can extend that to the Commonwealth as well and the people with different heritage and different backgrounds. So, you know, just for those who are watching perhaps from the USA or Canada, when we're talking about an Irish brigade, we're talking about a lot of Irish within that brigade, but also lots of people who just found themselves there because that's how conscription worked. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that as the description goes on. So the theme is North Africa, and we're particularly focusing on the Tunisia camp Tunisian campaign. So those watching, I hope you watched the show with Sam Wallace yesterday that gave a kind of good overview to what Operation Torch was. But now we're going to kind of micro focus on the role of this particular battalion. So as usual, Eddie has come armed with a very, very complete PowerPoint with, with not just lots of slides, lots of nice uh, slick sl uh, transitions as well. So a very, very posh one today. So I'll kind of hand over to you, Eddie, and then I will jump in with my usual comments for clarification. If people are watching and they've got uh, comments, um, please fire away. We've also got, I believe, Eddie's brother Richard is online in the sidebar to provide additional information there to help out with questions. So we've got a, we've got one one O'Sullivan on screen and one O'Sullivan in reserve in the on the subs bench, if you like, to help with the sidebar. And folks, I just want to take this time to briefly thank everybody 
for how active the sidebars have come in these last few weeks because I, I sometimes feel guilty that I don't have enough time to respond to every single comment coming in, and I don't because I'm trying to host, I'm trying to think about what to say next, I'm moving on slides. Um, but I do absolutely, and so do the viewers, appreciate the interaction you, you give there on the sidebar. It's wonderful to see the, the friendships that have, have established there. It's really a, a part of this channel that I didn't think was going to be coming. But anyway, I digress. So the Irish Brigade in Tunisia, November 1942 to May 1943. Over to you, Eddie. Well, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I, uh, can I do a little plug for other people you, before you I forget? A huge plug, yeah. Um, this is the book that if you really want to know about the Irish Brigade, this is the definitive work by Richard Doherty, who is a, remains one of the most active authors on Second World War history, and he wrote this definitive book. I'd also like to mention Ian Mitchell, who published a really authoritative account of the Battle of the Peaks west of Tunisia mm. in early 43. It's another one. And a, a shout out for two really fantastic, uh, three fantastic museums. One's the Inner Skilling Museum, which is in Inner Skilling in Northern Ireland, which is very active, very active team, very much worth a visit. They've got a huge amount of information about that regiment. And also the Royal Irish Fusiliers Museum in Armagh, which both of them are be beautiful places. And the third museum, of course, is the London Irish Rifles Museum, uh, which is in Camberwell in London, uh, which has got a lot of material. And uh, my brother Richard is works on that with them. So we, they're all very live. Anyway, uh, coming back to the story, in um, Sam Wallace is absolutely superb introduction uh, to this whole campaign with the Operation Torch and the landings there. I think he highlighted how politically complicated, mm. politically complicated Operation Torch was because it involved the British, the Americans, uh, the French, the Germans, the Italians, um, the Spanish, and of course, the got to mention the local population yeah. who were there in their millions. and. So it's a, extremely politically complicated. And then the creation of the Irish Brigade in January 1942 was also probably one of the most politically complex form uh, constructions of any British Army formation in the Second World War. And if you go to the next slide, I'll explain that. Uh, because um, it all started when Hubert Goff, who had been in the First World War commander of, uh, of the Fifth Army, very prominent commander, but he was, he was Irish. He was Irish, Anglo-Irish. That is, he is... Um, born in Ireland, considered himself Irish, but he's from the Anglo-Irish supremacy, as historians of Ireland would record. And he wrote a letter to the Times on the 26th of September, 1941. And the next, and this is the key quote, and he said in this uh, that he, um, if you click on it again, yep, Paul, yep, there we go. Um, he said, I venture to suggest, very, very, I venture to suggest that existing Irish units should be recruited as an Irish brigade or division. Now, this brought a response from Winston Churchill, and Winston Churchill had been in the cabinet uh, many times. If you go to the next slide, um, Winston Churchill, and this is the memo that he penned, the classic Winston Churchill epigrammic, very short. And he said, um, can we uh, consider this possibility? And he said in this memo, and I'll, if you click the next one, we have free French and Vichy French, so why not loyal Irish and Dublin Irish? Now, what do you mean by that? What he meant by the Dublin Irish is that he meant um, that Irish people in Ireland who saw their primary loyalty to the Irish government that had been created at independence in 1922, which was based in Dublin. So he considered those to be the Dublin Irish. Um, and those could, would include, I suspect, people who lived in Northern Ireland, which was still in the United Kingdom at that point, who looked towards the Irish, the Ireland, which became the Irish Republic. And so the loyal Irish, they, I, suggest, I, I think he applied, uh, applied that term to other Irish people who may be living in Ireland, they may be Catholic, they may be Protestant, but also had a sense of loyalty inherited. Uh, a lot of them were born when Ireland was still in, the whole of Ireland was still in the United Kingdom, to the British crown. Now this um, idea, Churchill confirmed support for this idea on the 6th of December, and this drew a response uh, from the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland um, in, a, in, a, in a letter to the Prime Minister on the 18th of December 1941. And it's a classic letter, which in many ways distills divisions uh, which still exist. So if you click on it, he said, um, so this is the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, which is a, a, a state which had been created in 1922, so almost a century ago. And uh, he was the Prime Minister, had its own parliament, and he had its own police force. And he wrote in this letter to uh, Winston Churchill and said, I wonder if the unfortunate implications of this suggestion are realised. The name of the Irish Brigade will be associated inevitably with the Irish who fought against England against Marlborough. Talk about long memory. Click on it again if you feel pulled. 
in the days of war, the Irish Brigade, which fought against Britain in the Boer War, uh, Sir Roger Casement's efforts in the last war, I won't go into that, and finally with the body of blue shirts in the Spanish Civil War, these were uh, pro-Francoist yeah. Irish Brigade, who went over to fight the Spanish Civil War. So basically the Northern Irish Prime Minister at that point um, was mainly representing a loyalist and unionist population, was objecting to the creation of the Irish Brigade. Now, the Irish Brigade was created in January 42, just after the Arcadia Conference, which is where the, uh, the United States and the United Kingdom formed their strategy, including uh, invading North Africa. And the Irish Brigade, I mean, Churchill's mother was American. Mm. Remember that. His yeah. father was very, very much involved in Irish, Irish politics. He'd been involved in Irish politics as a cabinet minister. And uh, he was very conscious of the power of the Irish dimension in Northern Ireland. So I am quite certain when he was thinking about the Irish Brigade, he said this is a way of conjuring up sympathy um, in uh, the United States from the Irish American community, which was the cornerstone of Roosevelt's uh, presidency. And they're very prominent Irish Americans, including J.F. Kennedy's father, John F. Kennedy's father, Robert Ken uh, Joseph Kennedy Sr., who had been ambassador in London until 1940. And they're very other. Bill Donovan, for example, he headed up. He was the first head of the, what became the CIA, another Irish American. So he was playing on that. And um, so the first commander of the Irish Brigade is this gentleman here. And he, in many respects, distills the kind of ambiguities and consistency. A uh, guy with the fur hat, he's in the, he's in the fogs, that's their full dress uniform, is the O'Donovan. And the O'Donovan, he's a clan chieftain. He's the chief of the O'Donovan clan. Yeah, he's Anglo, he's Anglo Irish. So he, he's Protestant, uh, but he came from Cork. They were very nationalistic. They, they believed in the whole of Ireland, but they also believed in Ireland being part of the United Kingdom. Now, he was the original commander, and he was replaced in, um, in, in he was replaced just, um, I'll get the date here. Uh, he was replaced in July 1942 by this gentleman sitting here with the chest full of medals, also from the Royal Irish Fusiliers. And, if, uh, and he was, um, his name was Nelson Russell. Again, Anglo-Irish, an Irishman born in Belarus. Uh, from the same cut from the same cloth he had played i think he played hockey for ireland so but he was very conscious of his irish of his irish dimension and the constituent parts of the irish brigade if you go to the next slide paul and this is a very truncated story and these three iconic photographs of the three original battalions that were put into the irish brigade when it was formed top left is a photograph of the first royal irish fusiliers and they were involved they were involved in the battle for france and the withdrawal from uh, Dunkirk. And the Royal Irish Fusiliers are known as the Fogs. And it's from an Irish expression called uh, Fogabola, which means clear the way, which had been the war cry of the Royal Irish Fusiliers right back to the Peninsular War. Fogabola, so they called it the Fogs. Bottom in the middle with a nice smiling gentleman, one with an umbrella. That photograph is taken either just before or after they went into action in Sicily. And that is the sixth Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, which is a wartime form battalion of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, which was based in Inniskilling. And uh, so that was the other battalion. So we had one regular formation, one wartime uh, formed battalion, and top right, the gentleman, that's, uh, it, it, he's actually one of the London Irish riflemen, lobbing a grenade at the opponent. This is an action shot during an operation in the Senia River in uh, spring of 1945. The London Irish Rifles, as I already mentioned, was a territorial army formation based in London. It was a rifle formation and therefore quite elite in its training, in a sort of particular type of training. Um, but um, they, were, they were affiliated to the Royal Ulster Rifles, the RUR, which was based in Northern Ireland. The Royal Ulster Rifles is a rifle uh, a battalion before partition, it was known as the Royal Irish Rifles. So these are the three line, the three line regiments that still existed, the line regiments that still existed in the British Army in 1942, were the Fogs, the Skins, as they were known, in the Skins, the Skins, and the Royal Ulster Rifles. So they're represented, all of them are represented in the Irish Brigade. So anyway, um, press on. That will do, there we go. So that's the picture of Operation Torch. And as uh, Sam Wallace mentioned, the, 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 the sheer scale of the operation is mind boggling. It's not only in the terms of shipping so many men or so, so far to a place they didn't, that didn't know. But look at the distance between Casablanca, where the Western Task Force landed, and Algiers, where the Eastern Task Force landed. 
Uh, and then I, I highlighted a couple of other places. So um, the, the history is on the 11th of November, as we heard yesterday, the, the Vichy French army uh, stopped resisting the invasion. That's when Admiral Darlan, who, who had been, um, the, the politics of this is so fascinating, but it is. he had basically been appointed high commissioner. And he was using the authority that he claimed from Patan. He claimed it was from Patan. He said, I, you will follow my rule because I am representing the legally constituted government of France, which is General Patan's. General Chirot, who had been shipped in by a submarine and brought over, he's, he's, a, he's on the run. He's on the run. He's, 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 not a proper, he's not a proper commander. So Darlan had the authority. And then for the, uh, November, they, they, the fighting stopped. And then the next stage of this operation could get underway, which involved dashing west. And this gentleman here, uh, General uh, Kenneth Anderson, he had been appointed to lead the First Army. The First Army was activated when he arrived in Algiers on the 9th of November. It's just the day after the landings began. He arrived. And then he had to assemble out of what was on the ground, out of all the expeditionary force, plus, plus the, the troops that were coming on by sea at that moment from Britain to create the first army on the run. And at the same time as assembling it, his mission was to capture Tunis as fast as possible. And if you can see in the next three slides, and I'm not going into the detail of these, the, the, this fighting. Oh, there's one other factor that needs to be borne in mind is that on the 11th of November, which is the moment when the, the, the French army in North Africa stopped resisting the Allied, the Anglo-American forces, the German army decided to invade the Vichy France. And that map shows the division between German-occupied France and Vichy France, which was still claimed technically to be the government of the whole of France and all its empire based in Vichy. Um, once the, uh, uh, the invasion had started, the Germans said, well, we're going to take over the whole thing. And they took over in a very efficient operation, the whole of Vichy France by the end of the month. But that didn't stop uh, the, some, uh, the, French, uh, the French scuttling their own fleet in Toulon by the end of the month. Anyway, pressing on. The, I'm, um, just saying this, I'm glad you're giving all this context, Eddie, because it's for those who are watching who don't, the, the, the establishment of the, the different motivations, shall we call it, of the various Irish elements is very important to this. I mean, it's, you know, my. You know, my great uncle, as I said, who was in the Royal Ulster Rifles. I mean, he was just—he was a TA in in West London. I mean, he had no Irish connections whatsoever, North or South, Catholic or Protestant. Really, he was just a soldier. And he always said, the minute he joined the Royal Ulster Rifles, they said, "Look, this is a, this is this is not political. Whatever you, whatever you, whatever opinions you have, you leave it at the door of the drill hall." And you know, the London because he was territory London Irish territorial before the war, and the same thing with the war. So they tried to keep politics out of it but yeah and and focus on the fact there's hitler to defeat is that is but it is intriguing and fascinating the the origins of of the, of the irish units and and all their reasoning behind why they did and didn't volunteer and who they volunteered with and who they wanted to serve with for what reason it's a fascinating sub sub part of world war ii absolutely and of course i mean if you talk to anybody from ireland we've got very long memories and we'll talk endlessly about different periods of irish history and disagree about it as well but by the end of the month, the, the, I mean, the First Army got so close to Tunis. I mean, by the 15th of November, they were 30 miles away from, uh, from Tunis. And in six days, they got to this point. They've gone hundreds of miles by road. <clears throat> and then, but the, the other side, the Axis forces, have responded amazingly fast. And what happened, and this was not, I don't think, properly anticipated, is that the, the Germans and the Italians flew in and by boat, they rushed in tens of thousands of troops. So by the time the advanced elements of the First Army had reached the outskirts of Tunis, they were outnumbered. And they were also facing, for the first time, tiger tanks. That's strategic, tactically really important. So the first, they, they raised, they got to the outskirts of Tunis. I'm going to that area that's red, uh, circled in red. And that's by the end of November. And then that's when they were blocked. If you go to the next slide, Paul. Uh, this was followed by the Taburba engagement, where the, the, the Axis forces were actually went onto the offensive, uh, deploying their Tiger tanks and their well-established technique tactics. They were using experienced troops against an army. This is an army which, is, to a great extent, had no had no previous experience combat experience in the Second World War. They were also outnumbered, and the uh, and the Axis forces had air superiority at this point. The advanced uh, the advanced elements of the First Army were beyond air cover. And they were really surviving on the rations and material they could carry with them, hundreds of miles. 
And in the next slide, you'll see uh, that's the Tobibo engagement. Then you had a very powerful counterattack on the 6th to 10th of December 42, in which the, uh, the Axis forces, mainly the Germans, drove back the advanced elements of the First Army. I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but the next slide, this leads on to the next part of this. And I'll put a circle around this point, Longstop Hill, which is a legendary uh, place for, um, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, and, and just to confirm, this is exactly what Sam was saying yesterday, that the, the strength of Operation Torch in terms of the landings was not really replicated by the strength in depth behind it. Logistically, it was kind of... It was lacking there and as you said the distances they covered the bringing up the reinforcements bringing up everything else was a little bit lacking because we're talking 42 we're talking as we said yesterday when the allies haven't got much strength in depth and then suddenly as you say the germans start bringing in all their reinforcements and suddenly uh, the, the, the 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 balance of power swings and it swung very significantly in that kind of very large you know december 42 era and that's what we're obviously going to be talking about well, one of the things that was discussed yesterday by Sam is to what extent did the Vichy French know, or to what extent did the Axis know this was going to happen? And then I, I, I'm pretty certain that this was this is not a well kept secret. The, the reason why Admiral Darlan showed up in uh, in Algiers four days, three days before the land uh, the operation talk started, because he must have known he was going to come, and he wanted to be on the ground to to do it. And it's said that Petain knew at least a week before Operation Torch. Petain knew. That was going to happen so that's the case i think they were ready anyway on the there was on the um at the the uh at the end of december an attempt was made by the first army at the last attempt was to break back up the Nigeria valley tunisia is um if it's like italy or it's it's mainly in this area it's mainly held at high ground with one or two valleys and it's like going through the scottish highlands you've got a few glens surrounded by high points so there's very few access routes there's only basically two access routes to tunis from the west and this was the main one. It's called Najerda Valley. And um, it was known, Hannibal even said, the key to Carthage was the Najerda Valley. It was the, uh, the town called Najer Zalban, which means key to the door, which means key to the door to Tunis. So the Najerda Valley was where they went. And the, uh, a very powerful attack was made. And the, um, the fighting on Longstop Hill, Longstop Hill will come to later, the very commanding high point over the main road from Najer Zalban, which is down to the south of this map, to Tunis. And in order to clear the way, you had to get the high points. This was very much a battle for high points. Tunisia was battle for the high ground. And so the um, uh, so there was a very body th three day battle on Longstop Hill, which is a legendary moment. V Victoria crosses were won. But in the end, it was recognized that the first army simply hadn't have enough strength. It didn't have the air cover. It didn't have the tanks. It didn't have the ability to break through in, in terrible weather. So they had to withdraw. And on the 24th of December, Eisenhower, you've got to remember, never had any combat operation before. Yep. He went up to see what was going on. It reminds you what happened when people were thinking in, in the First World War, when people talk, went to eat for the first time. They couldn't believe the situation. He went up on the 24th of December and he could see, he could see uh, vehicles stuck in the mud. You could see the terrible conditions of pouring rain. He said, it's impossible. We cannot make Tunisia by Christmas as hoped and planned. So the whole thing was called off on the 26th of November, and that operation had cost. The attack up the Majorda Valley had cost more than 20,000 casualties. This was serious, horrible fighting in uh, really unpleasant uh, circumstances. So the decision at that point was then, right, we're not going to be able to take Tunis until we've got enough resources up. So the next three to four months were spent on basically holding the line. Now, before we get to this, these two gentlemen, it's politics for you again. On the left is General Giraud. Now, Darlan, who I mentioned before, had been very conveniently assassinated on the 24th of December by a monarchist assassin, the sort of Lee Harvey Oswald of his time, a mystery lone gunman who shot Darlan. And Darlan was, um, the, the assassin in turn, was, was executed two days later, extrajudicially, so nobody knows quite what's going on. But anyway, Giraud, his gentleman on the left, who was the one that Eisenhower and the Allies initially always wanted to come be a high commissioner, he was given the job in High Commissioner for France, Northwest France, with plenty of potentiary powers. He was effectively the French government. And then, um, but the other character, of course, is General Charles de Gaulle, someone who actually claimed Irish descent. Did you know that? Some people say one of the reasons why de Gaulle had a bit of a problem in the UK was not only did he know French history, but he knew Irish history I as well. I have no idea about that. Yes, yeah, he, claimed, he, claimed, he claimed French I mean, descent. That's a bit like when, you know, 
everyone claims Irish descent on St. Patrick's Day, don't they? Everyone claims, but my great-grandfather... Yeah, that's the, the plastic Irish that come out. But anyway, I didn't know de Gaulle did. That's amazing. No, no, no. Some people say that's one of the reasons he was really particular. Now, uh, de Gaulle, he's got his own history, but he had got out of France and he'd been recognised sort of reluctantly as the leader of the French, Free French. The United Kingdom at this point, of course, refused to recognise the Vichy government, said, oh, it's not a legitimate government. Whereas the, the US government in June 1940 had recognized them. Yeah. So the British government said, you're not a legitimate government. And they came up with an alternative, which was not internationally recognized by any means, uh, which was led by Charles de Gaulle, who was in, who was in London at that point. And Charles de Gaulle had a very particular idea about what the future of France and his role in it. And it didn't really include many other people. And he certainly was not going to defer to Giraud, who he considered to be someone who was, was a temporizer. De Gaulle was all for the uh, a total opposition to the Germans and and to reverse the defeat of 1940. Anyway, so what happened, Giraud was appointed and then de Gaulle was, uh, Churchill had to persuade de Gaulle. He said, look, get out of London, go down to, uh, get down to the Casablanca conference, which was going to be held in mid-January, and we'll make sure something's sorted out. So it took some time, but it wasn't, it wasn't until, then what happened to de Gaulle? Giraud wasn't interested in politics, de Gaulle was. And it, but it wasn't until 1943, May 43, that the uh, French Committee for National Liberation, which became the government in waiting for free France, was formed. So there was a, there was a hiatus of another year or so. And the free French government was based in Algiers. It based in Algiers so for that period. That's where, the, that's where de Gaulle was. And also that's where Eisenhower was. And as we'll see later, that's where other people were who would play a very important role in post-war Europe. Next slide. So now we're going to uh, now we're going to get on. Oh yeah, and the other person who was in Algiers in that period was this man, Harold Macmillan, future Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, Chancellor Exchequer, and Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He was appointed by Winston Churchill to be his ministerial resident with plenty of potentiary powers based in Algiers. So you had this incredible mixture of Eisenhower who became President of the United States, De Gaulle who became President of France. Harold Macmillan, who's going to become pre uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, all in Algiers around the same time. It's a little known story. It's almost like a play. You could write a, a play about these guys. Anyway, next slide. And then add Eisenhower and Patton to that mix as well, who are in the, in the, in theatre as well. I mean, everybody who was anybody is there, aren't they, essentially? Well, they're, they're, they're learning a few lessons. So if you just click on, so just get all the arrows up, and I'll just yeah. explain. Uh, that'll do. So basically, what happened, the Irish Brigade... Um, the three battalions have been training in Scotland since June. Uh, it's pretty well known that they were going to be going to North Africa, but they got on the, the London Irish and the Fogs all sailed at the same time from, from Glasgow. Uh, the Fogs were shipped over to Liverpool, and the, uh, the London Irish landed at a place called Bajaya. No, they, they landed in Algiers, and they went by train to Bajaya, and then went by truck, a really scenic drive, anybody's done it, through Constantine, beautiful in the Atlas, all the way to the front line, at the end of the arrow. The skins, on the other hand, they went to Algiers and they were put by boat around Tanaba, which is that town there. And then they drove and they, all, they so they're all coming together. The, 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 the view that the, the, the ordinary man, like my father said, why, why did we get land in Algiers when we had to travel by train and truck? You know, hundreds and hundreds of miles anyway. But the, by the end of the, uh, by 24th of December, if you go to the next slide, uh, the, um, just a, a scenic photograph of the Atlas Mountains, very beautiful. Um, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Irish Brigade, uh, these are people who never left the country in the main, or hardly left the country. My father had left much, uh, had left London much. And suddenly they're in this alien world um, where the, there were about a million settlers who were French-speaking and brought their culture with them in the whole of Northwest Africa, mainly in Algeria. But of course they were the Berber and the Arab people. These, this was a completely alien world. They were going into a place they knew nothing about. The maps had been created, but there was no experience, no British experience of the ground there. So they were going into an unknown through Snow Peak. And one of the things about, you read these stories, is the first Irish Brigade casualty inevitably wasn't in combat. It was a result of a road accident. They were coming by troop carriers from the skins from an arbor. One of the, uh, one of the troop carriers went off the, uh, the narrow road, 13 injured, one killed. So the first mortality in combat zone or in theater for the Irish Brigade was a Roland Farthing, who was a 22 year old from Grimsby. And he's buried at the Medjaz al -Bab. But I think one of the stories of the war is an awful lot of casualties were not due to combat. People were dying in accidents. They were dying of, uh, dying of disease. 
also and they're designed down on mistakes and errors and mishandling of equipment so it's one of the sad thing truths of any war anyway by the end of the uh, december the irish brigade had deployed around a, a village called gubalat and we were there in 2018 and we've been there before and that gives you a sense of the countryside it's flat it's called the gubalat plain it extends about 10 or 15 miles to the south down to to some high ground around a place called burrata we'll come to you in a minute and in the distance they're surrounded by high ground and when they got there they really didn't know where the Germans. they knew the germans were there and there wasn't a proper front line so they were operating in the environment where they they didn't know anything really didn't wear anything with it. and they, they they a lot of patrolling activity quite a lot of casualties and one of the problems is that the tanks they had tank support from the lothian and border horse which was in the sixth armor division it's a point that the the irish brigade was in the sixth armor division and the lothian uh, uh lothian uh, horse uh, uh border horse with the tank regiment they were using churchills but the problem was if you walk around this area you'll see that it's like silt it's all been washed off the hills it's silt, and when you put a bit of water into it it's like cement literally like cement and the tanks couldn't operate and the earliest operation with tanks they got completely bogged and were useless so the irish brigade were deployed take another photograph and this shows you another view of the area um yeah that's looking to looking east from where they were to the jebel rihan and the irish brigade had an area of about 15 to 20 miles north and south to look after as well as to patrol over 10 15 miles it was a huge area they didn't have any proper cover they were all camping out but over was you know it's raining muddy it was a really bad experience and one of the problems was the supply wasn't good uh, they didn't see a, a piece of bread for months and they also suffered from looting one of the things they found that they were opening up their boxes of rations find bricks in them instead of food and so they were under they, they definitely felt under resourced and on the supply but and nevertheless is, just, just to jump in a bit this is it's not a recipe for disaster because we know there were successes later on albeit they they were struggles but we, we know the maps are lacking for this area here compared to maps they would have british troops have had for places like you know north uh, um uh, belgium or france or, or the netherlands um lacking in understanding of the terrain the conditions the soil the, the vegetation the cover uh problems of not really not understanding the local mentality and looting and engagement and, and communication language it's it's all it's all familiar for kind of 1942 when you think about the british being pushed out of burma they were the kind of things that we that were were, were rife there and an unfamiliarity with the train uh, not enough good maps not enough communication failure to understand the local point of view and these are the things that, uh, that the british army and the Commonwealth are, are good at working out at later on but in this period now it's a very very steep learning curve isn't it absolutely and also they found themselves against some really stiff opposition including directly opposite them uh, was the german paratroop regiment now they were commanded by colonel walter Koch, and he was a legendary para veteran of the french campaign and the german invasion so the the germans were deploying they weren't second rank they were deploying some of their best and most experienced troops and this is what the you know the i wouldn't call them novices but they were combat inexperienced irish brigade were dealing with so the um yeah, that's a general Rehan. If you go to the next slide, Paul. Yeah, so uh, it, it, I mean, this is an overlook. It, it, this is a battle of low ground and high points. And the high point at the top, that's the long stop overlooking the road. The red line is the axiom of advance. This is the way that the the, uh, the first army wanted to go. Gubalat, you can see, Grandstand is a high point. We'll come to that in a minute. And Burrada, the town. So there is a Roman road between Gubalat, Grandstand, and Burrada. And basically to the west, that was basically German land. And to the east, that was allied, but nobody really knew. There wasn't a front line, and you could get into serious problems. So the, um, the, the growing increase in numbers of as the Germans were flooding in and deploying more and more troops, there was concern that some of the high points to the east of the, this road between Kubala and Burrata would be taken over. So the Irish Brigade was given the first oper serious operation to capture a high point east of the Burrata Gubalat Road, known as Two Tree Hill, named Two Tree Hill because it had two trees on it. So if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little about that operation. If you give it a little click, this, this map is, is, is a Jugal Earth map, maybe not so great. That's Two Tree Hill. On the left, I don't think you can see it yet, uh, that's Two Tree Hill. If you, go for, if you go to the, yeah, that's Grandstand Hill there. That's a hill that's about uh, five, 600 feet above the ground. And then further to the west from Grandstand, is the road if you if you yeah you can see the road uh which is the roman road so 
Two, three hills, this hill, and um, they were, the Irish Brigade was given the task of capturing it. And this was the first big operation, battalion operation attack by the six skins. You set off uh, before sunrise on the 13th of January, and there's an arrow that'll come up. You click, you click, there's an arrow that'll come up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's basically the direction. You can walk this ground. It's completely unchanged. Um, and they advanced and take Two Tree Hill, and they were supported by Grant tanks. You, you know the Grant tanks. It's a rather odd one with the with the, the gun set on one side. And uh, no... Yeah, seven uh, millimeter in the turret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they were supported by that. But it was a classic infantry op operation. Uh, they had troop carriers, of course, and that made a lot of noise. So they knew that the Germans were expecting them because they were hardly. And the, it was like quagmire. It had been raining the night before. And pretty quickly, as they advanced to the top of True Tree Hill, they came under very high uh, uh, intense machine gun and mortar fire, not only from the hill itself, but from all around. And if you look at the next, if you look at the next uh, map, that is, uh, uh, that is a contemporary photograph of Two Tree Hill. Now, apart from the two trees, which were chopped down, uh, that's more or less as it looked at the time. The very little cover, and actually on the top of the hill, all the topsoil had been washed away, couldn't dig in. So the skins in their attempts, when they were trying to get up the hill, and they tried for three or four hours to get up the hill, they were constantly being repulsed, and this machine gun fire, mortar fire, and they were taking serious casualties, and they had to withdraw. And this photograph, which is coming up next, um, is a photograph taken immediately after. It's a photograph taken from Grandstall from the west, looking east. And the, one of those hills is, is, is Two Tree Hill. And this is the skins coming back after having a pretty awful experience. Uh, this is in the middle of the afternoon. And in this attack, I think the casualty, right? Yeah, they had 100 men killed, wounded, and missing. So they lost one in five of, their, of, their, of the people who started. The, the, you know, you're talking about 120, 100 men or so combat in the attacking companies, and they lost 100. And this is the first operation. And it hadn't gone well. So they were withdrawn and they, were, they, they sat on uh, Grandstand Hill. Now, the next day, and this is the political context, in Casablanca, these four guys, de Gaulle, Roosevelt, Giraud and Churchill, they all met and they decided they're going to take Sicily once Tunisia had been taken. They set the date for the capture of Tunisia at the 15th of May, amazingly. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, but one of the other things that, as a result of this is that the commanders, the, uh, Anderson was getting pressure from Casablanca that he should be active. You know, what are you doing on the front? Why aren't you making, why haven't you got Tunisia? You can imagine Churchill going on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, on yeah. It. <clears throat> and, the, and Roosevelt was obsessed with Stalin. He, he, he said, whatever we can do, we're gonna keep a Soviet Union in the war. Because if the Soviet Union, the Soviets drop out of the war, there's no way we can win. We might well lose, we can't win. Now, I've got to win this by 44, because if I don't, I'll lose the presidential election. So there was a lot of pressure coming down the line. So uh, the, this led to the next development for the Irish Brigade, and this is cited by the, uh, which is that the, the Irish Brigade were told, right, I know you suffered badly, but this time take that hill, but use the whole brigade. Now, Russell, who was the brigade commander, he protested. He said, this is suicidal. We're going to get wiped out in this attack. The whole brigade's going to go down the tubes. And he went to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're going to do a night attack later that day. He went to bed rather miserably. But he'd woken up four hours later because the Germans had launched a major attack that day. It was the day that the brigade was supposed to be attacking the Germans. The Germans had a major attack, mainly to hit the French forces at Buarada. Von Arnim, the commander of the German forces, had concluded that if you want to do damage, hit the French army, which is south of the First Army, because it was, it was weak. It wasn't as well equipped. So he launched a major attack. And then in the afternoon, the, uh, the guys on Grandstand Hill looked across and they could see the 30 panzers wanging towards them, followed by hundreds of howling uh, German panzer grenadiers, well tanked up, it appeared, uh, mm -hmm. and howling. And the only, uh, if you press it, they, they, how, they went for Grandstand and took part of Grandstand by the, um, by, the, the, by the early morning and then pressed on further to try and cut the Burrada Road. Uh, you can click and see, and that, it just shows you, if you click it again, yeah. That's the direction of the attack. It was only held by a massive artillery divisional bombardment, which had been, um, I don't know if they were better, well informed, but they had the artillery division, they smashed up, they practically destroyed all the tanks. But it was another pretty close, it was a close shave from the brigade. And that view is looking from, looking east from Grandstand. We were there standing on the hilltops looking across. That is the ground that this attack took place, largely unchanged from where it was back in 1943. And in fact, not only can you find 
um, barbed wire, German and British, all over the place. You can also see the entrenchments on Grandstand here. You can actually walk along and you can see them because the Allies were there for something like four months. And one of the tragedies, when we were there first time, 2013, we met uh, a Tunisian who burst into tears when we told him that we were th what we were doing because he said that his son, I mean, it's an amazing thing to do, that his son, 20 years earlier, then aged about 10, had been walking on Grandstand and had picked up a grenade and had been killed. So mm -hmm. this war, yeah, I know, I mean, you couldn't believe it, you couldn't believe it. This war was killing people long after. And the whole, but the whole area is, is it, the beauty of many of the Irish brigades, the beauty of the, uh, of the Irish brigade campaigns is practically all of them, that's in Tunisia, Sicily, and Italy, are in the most beautiful countryside. <laughs> I was going to say there's, there's worse places to stand looking at World War II actions. You know, for, you know, the, 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 the Eastern Front guys who go to some of the you know the, the winter battles and they're in the freezing cold. It's that's no fun. This this looks um looks quite a good place to go. Lovely, you, I love you. Thirty miles from Tunis, so you can have your breakfast in your hotel. You can take your bus down, go for a nice walk. Uh, beautiful, you know, right time of the year. It's it's, it's like Southern Italy. It's really beautiful. It's full of flowers in spring. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. Anyway, next. Um, now the next, the next, well, yeah, I mean, it's now this is the, the 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 most disastrous moment in the Irish Brigade's history. I think some people would dispute that they were still under pressure, and, and so the the, the uh, this is photograph is taken again from Grandstand, looking southwest to towards the east, and the those that ridge that you can see in front, that one, yeah. If you click again. The, these are two high points. If you just click it again, to, I've got some arrows. I'll, the arrows will come up. Um, the the fear was that the Germans again it's misbehaving. No, keep going. It'll come go. up yep, again. Yep. So the uh, the fear was that a uh, hill two seven nine. It's two seven nine meters and two eight six. Which you click again, Paul, you'll see it. Uh, and you can see that these were going to be taken up by the Germans. I mean, there's a lot of uh, tactical monkeying around here, and nobody really knew. So the London Irish Rifles sit at this point. The fog said they had some engagements, and London Irish at this point hadn't really been seriously involved in major battles. Now it is the term for the London Irish Rifles. And so at a dawn on the 20th of January, the London Irish Rifles advanced basically from the, the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, that's it, from there, a bit further up, up that hill, and, and all four companies were deployed. There was no artillery barrage and no tank support. So I don't know what they were expecting there. I don't think they were expecting much. And so they went up at night, and by the middle of the day, they had taken both hills and seized them. But they found themselves in a hopelessly exposed position. So for the next eight hours or so, they were bombarded. This is a map that shows the line yeah. of advance, Hill 279, 286. Grandstand was where the photograph was taken from there to there. They found themselves, they, they practically lost, I think they lost all their company, all but one of their company commanders. They couldn't dig into the ground. And it was really an awful situation. And by the end of the day, they just about hung on. And they thought the worst was over. But at midnight that night, the, the Germans launched a tank attack and swept the London Irish off those hills. And as a result of that operation, the London Irish lost 250. That's around half of their combat effectiveness. And practically all, you know, their main, uh, these are people who've been trained for three years and they've been extinguished in not much more than two days. Uh, this photograph was sent to us because it's a photograph of some of the prisoners that were taken. This is a German photograph. They were taken around that time. And they're London Irishmen. Do you see the London Irish because they wore the core beam with the hat badge over the right eye? So these are some of the lads that were taken. As you can see, not a particularly happy situation for them. They had a horrible experience. And as a result of this, the commanding officer, this is the main reason why the commanding officer, the London Irish Rifles, was replaced. In inevitably, when something goes wrong like that, someone's going to get it. In the so, there's army. always a fall, guy, isn't it? Deservedly or undeservedly, someone always has to kind of take the responsibility. And it, it's a weird thing that's come up on World War II TV a lot because that, it seems unfair, and yet I can see the point of view of feeling that they have to do something to make everybody think that we've done something to correct this so it won't happen again. It's always bad for the poor guy, but... You, if you don't do anything at all, people say, but you haven't done anything. It's it's a very weird situation that happened a lot in World War II, and it's a, yeah, it's 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 complicated. Absolutely, and the uh, well, someone probably had to get it. Uh, they were going to, there was a possibility the second battalion was going to be dissolved, but the decision was made no, just reinforce it. Uh, and something I want to shout out to is that one of the men involved in this attack in two seven nine two eight six, Charles Wood Ward, is still with us. 
102, it's 103, I think, in November. Wow. And uh, absolutely amazing and absolutely lucid. He kept his uh, notes of this campaign. He features in our film about this campaign. Anyway, press on. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the, the, the detail. This is the Marath Line. This Marath Line was built. It's on the border between Tunisia and Algeria. And, of course, it was built by the, by the French not to fight the British or the Germans, but the Italians. Yeah. This is because the French thought the Italians, who, who had occupied what is now Libya in 1911, was going to come in. So they built uh, fortifications, a kind of Maginot line down on the border, very handy for the Germans, as it turned out. And one of the things that uh, uh, Tunisians with an interest in this period said their main concern in 1942 was not the French, not even the Germans. It was the Italians. Yeah. There were more Italians in Tunisia at this point than there were anybody else. And they thought Mussolini was going to get add Tunisia to his uh, his new Roman Empire. And, and so, a good point to just quickly mention that, that that the Italian army was not the pathetic force comedy yeah. shows of recent yeah. years have come to talk about. In fact, tonight tomorrow's show with Giulio is about a, an, an Italian victory in 1941. I mean, the... The, the alo alo image of the captain where he was with all the feathers in his hat is, is not really fair. And, and sure, there's a bit of caricature element, Mussolini himself, but it, it's very annoying when you see a tweet or something on Facebook when someone just dismisses completely, oh, the Italian Navy were crap, the Italian Army were crap. And you go, so why is it that some of the units that fought against the, the, the units in the desert say the toughest units they engaged were the Italians? What, if that's... If they were that bad, why do men who were there refer to them as being really, really dangerous? It's it, I don't know why the world has come to believe the Italians were useless. I mean, this is a general, broad thing. Why, why would they, Why would the Germans depend on them you, if yeah, they were that useless? It, exactly. It's um, it's a it's a subject I'd like to delve into more. The Italian reputation and and his well, because we've um, got good friends in Italy, and I'm sure they share the perspectives. I, I mean, I can compress this. But basically, uh, the 23rd of January. So this is around the same time as, as the the the, uh, the 279286. Uh, Montgomery took uh, captured Tripoli, and the Africa Corps then withdrew. So at that point, the Africa Corps under Rommel combined with the uh, with Arnhem's troop, and then so the Germans had a very formidable force in southern Tunisia, and that was the inspired the attack on the Amer uh, the American Second Corps, which you discussed yesterday in the Battle of Kazarine. I'm not going to go into that in any way. Uh, but there were some further attacks, so more or less the, uh, the one of the last attempts to push back the Allies in Tunisia in the Western Front uh, was Operation Ox's Head Oxendorf, and that was launched uh, around the 25th or 26th of February. And it, it took the Irish case. So if you get to the next slide, I'll just talk about this operation. So we're back on the map. Now that's Grandstand, and the road, you see the road that comes from north to south, and there was an area to the left about a mile long called Stuka Ridge, and that was held by the London Irish Rifles, who'd been put there because they'd been so badly damaged, they needed a bit, you know, a safe place to be. Grandstand was then been held by the fogs and some of the fogs in reserve and uh, and 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 the skins. So anyway, what happened uh, is that on the morning of the, I think it's the, I think it's the twenty fifth, and my brother Richard check, fact checking will tell you, tell me whether it's the twenty fifth or twenty sixth, that the there was a major attack to try and break through Allied lines in this area, and. Uh, 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 paratroopers and uh, panzer grenadiers attacked up Stuka Ridge, where the black the black is the shadow that shows the high point, and they attacked up that hill and they hit the London Irish who were sitting there, not expecting any action from that direction at all. Um, so in the course of that day, if you go to this, I've got this couple of photographs. Uh, that's a photograph. You click again. That's a photograph taken from Stuka Ridge, looking across to Grandstand. You click again. So this will be the view that the London Irish on the Tuka Ridge would have seen that day, largely unchanged, with the grandstand being held by the fogs. Next. Uh, this is a photograph taken from the uh, Gubalat Plain looking up to the Stuka Ridge. It's called the Stuka Ridge because it had been Stukered. And the centre of it, the largest building on Stuka Ridge, if you go to the next photograph, is called Stuka Farm. Uh, called Stuka Farm because Brigadier Scott, uh, uh, because, the, um, uh, because the London Irish commander uh, at this point, Pat Scott, he would taken over following. Uh, he used that. I, I, actually, I, I think I've got that wrong. I'm just going to say this was a brigade HQ in 43, and it's called Stuka Farm because it was always been Stukered. And this is the same site today. Uh, and that building is on the site, and that's my brother Richard walking towards it. Next. 
anyway, they were, they, the, the attack was beaten off. And one of the reasons why is uh, people like him, Captain Strom Galloway was actually a Canadian officer. He had been seconded from the, the Canadian uh, as to be a company commander uh, to be in the London Irish Rifles. And he was heavily involved in hand to hand fighting. He survived the war. That's him there with his moustache. Quite a legendary figure in Canada, actually. Galloway, I suspect he's got a bit of a Celtic connection. Next. And the other thing about the Grandstand fight, for those people who like Spike Milligan, that he was there. He was with the Raw Matil uh, Artillery just behind Stuka Ridge. And he went up to Grandstand Ridge during this fighting, uh, laying out telegraph wires because he was an observer. Yeah. And it was the results of his actions during this battle that he got his mentioned dispatches. And it's just worth mentioning because we did, you know, we did the show about Spike Milligan or oh, nearly a year ago now, and Stuart Lee, the comedian, was on, and Spike's daughter is on, and, and Peter Caddick Adams particularly was saying, which kind of surprised me but didn't surprise me, how, and I'm interested in your opinion, how reliable Spike Milligan's account of the fighting is. Because as a kid, I just read it as a very fun or a very funny series of books that just made me wet myself with laughter, and then it had these harrowing moments of his experience of war, but it was surprising that the detailed recollections of the battle, and he was a big war buff. He had all his maps and atlases and books out there. So from your point of view and your brother's point of view, you know, can, can you use Spike's book as a good guide to the battle? I th I, well, I think on this particular, he mentions meeting some Irish um, sergeants. So he knew he's mentioned the London Irish, but he was very diligent when he got down to the facts. No joking about the facts from Spike. Yeah. He made jokes to relieve tension. And he mocked himself mainly, but he was a really committed veteran. He was yeah. proud of his service and his comedy in a way highlighted it. And this book, I think all of the books, all of them are absolutely wonderful reads. And uh, anyway, that's the, the book about this period. Love it. Uh, Gunner who, Rommel. Anyway, uh, if you press on, uh, this one is just a generic photograph. Uh, and we get to the next part of the... There, just, that's the tank we were talking about earlier, folks. In you are right. You are right. Uh, we're, not, um, we're, we're up to speed. But, yeah. And yeah by, the, by the end of the... Uh, after this period, the Irish Brigade were taken out to land for... That's about the end of March and put in rest and recreation. And the uh, this is a photograph of the key figures in the brigade at that point. And the right is Nelson Russell, Irish Brigade commander. On the, and the centre is Pat Scott, who is uh, the at this point... Uh, commanding officer of the, uh, of the London Irish Rifles, second battalion. The previous he was originally a fog. He was subsequently to become the brigadier of the Irish Brigade, the legendary figure. And on the left is Lieutenant Colonel Be Beecham Butler, who was the commanding officer of the Six in the Skillings. The um, sorry of the first fogs. The um, he was originally a skin. Um, the one that's not in this photograph is Neville Gracebrook, who who took over because the the commander of the original commanding of the skins had been seriously wounded at the in, in one of the first casualties of skins in, in, in I think December 1942 was their commanding officer so there was a bit of uh, a change but these are the three key figures if you go on to the next the um, the, the the brigade had been transferred by then into the 78th division uh, uh, he came initially he wasn't in the 70th he was in the 6th Army division had been transferred to the 78th division and I think a guards battalion was switched out but anyway this is uh, takes you up to the next, the final phase of the battle. This is the perimeter. The red line is where the perimeter of the German army had been forced back to by the 20th of April, 1943. So from the west, the first army really made very little progress from where they, they'd been, you know, for months. From the south, the eighth army had advanced to, to that position. So the, the, how do you how do you uh, finish this war off? Now on the 20th of April, I think that's the date. And that's when all supplies for the Axis forces in this pocket were cut off. And at that point, the game was over. They were running, they, they had running out of ammunition, they had probably no air cover, and they were running out of food, and they were just left there. And of course, famously, uh, Hitler wouldn't let them withdraw. Um, by this point, von Arnim was in command of all the forces. Rommel had got hepatitis, hepatitis in March and gone back to Berlin. And um, he, he didn't come back to Africa. His last operation was, uh, I think, the the Kazarin part, or oh, the Marathon encounter in March, anyway. Yeah. So Von Arnim, classic Prussian officer, very correct, not a party guy, very dry, very effective. He's in command. He had about 300,000 or so uh, German Ameri uh, and uh, German-Italian troops, but they were completely hemmed in, and the opposition now was several, twice the size. So the operation to finish this all off was developed. If you click it again, I'll just show you the configuration very roughly. Under south is the 8th Army with Bernard Montgomery surging in. If you click it again, 
if you just click it again there Paul, just click it once more. Yeah, yeah Eighth Army. Yeah, That's the first army came to found Anderson, and the second corps had been moved from the south up to the north. At this point, it was under Omar Bradley. Um, Patton had been sent back to prepare the uh, to start training for the Operation Husky, which is going to take place. I mean, we're talking it was June. We talked about the twenty of April. So the plan was for Tunis to be taken, you know, within a month, and then the uh, then the preparations would take place for Sicily. So Patton was being off for training there. Omar Bradley, who had been nominated by Patton, uh, and Patton promoted Bradley, that was commanding the Second Corps, First Army, so that was the extent of it. And basically what the operation entailed was the Eighth Army to keep the pressure up, but all the, all the energy to be diverted from the West, with some of the um, Eighth Army armour being transferred up to the West. Now, the Irish Brigade's role in this particular part of the, the battle, if you go to the next, is shown lack location. See that yellow? You know, they had they gone back. They they were near Major Zabab. So we'll come uh, next. Match shows you some of the detail of what they had to do. So if you click on it again, you can see that the acts of advance. So it's that's basically the course of the the Majorna River. The lake there wasn't there at the time. Right. It's Lake Zaga. But the major uh, the Majorna River flowed up, and then from Major Zabab, if you click it again, you'll see the axis was that way. The road goes up that way. But on the north side, in order to get through, you had to you had to deal with some high points, and the high points will be shown now. The first high point, that's long stop. And there's a series of high points going up to 2,500 feet overlooking the route west. These had to be taken first, and this is the subject of Ian Mitchell's uh, book, Battle of the Peaks. And at that and the, the first uh, battle was to the left, and the Irish Brigade took, no, no, further to the left, it's the, that one, yeah around there they, they, they took a hill called Jebel Mahdi in the course of that battle uh, the um, Charles Heber Allen another Irish brigade commanding officer was killed so so, the, the, so he was killed he was shot by I think by a sniper right through his head he stuck his head up on the hill anyway that hill was taken but the the next operation is that the Irish brigade now using mules because there were no proper roads so could get tanks up there they moved on to this next operation uh, which I will deal with in the next couple of slides. Don't worry, we're almost finished. Do you click on a few uh, points? And this is the area they were involved with. Uh, and that's it. So they were, see these high, they're called high, they're high points. This is a Google map, and it's not particularly good. It's Betia is a high point, Alang is a high point, Keffel Tour, 622, Tanguja. All these were high points that needed to be taken. And in the middle is this village called Hydas, uh, which was a German strong point. So they were all interconnected. So if you go to the next slide, there might be a better view of this, which yeah. is taken from the uh, Majorda Valley. This is right next to Longstop. So Longstop, which is the hill everyone was trying to capture. But actually, if you go back again, Paul, uh, the actual the main problem was Tangutra and Kerfell Tour. These high points, if you didn't take those high points, you're not going to take, you won't be able to take Longstop. So that was recognized. So this is from the van. You can see where it is. And you can see Kerfell Tour, how high these places are. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, that's Hydus. That's taken from Keffel Till, looking down at Hydus. That's what it looks like now. And the next slide shows what it looked like after the Irish Brigade had finished sorting it out. Uh, and the operation, the main operation against Hydus and these lines, was launched on the 22nd, on the 22nd of April as part of Operation Vulcan. All across the Western Front, they, they, there was a coordinated uh, attacks by the First Army and Second Corps and the Eighth Army. But the main thrust was to try and get break the roads. And eventually this area, all these high points were eventually taken by the 25th, 26th of April. But the uh, the fogs, um, amazing activity. It was pure infantry work. And eventually they got some tanks up there, which was a miracle. Uh, but it was real infantry work against a very determined opposition that simply couldn't give up. And it was in that fight. Uh, anyway, uh, next. Yeah, next. I just Sorry. want to you know, remind people again that, you know, because I always bring it back to Normandy because that's my frame of reference because I live here, is that we're again talking about the part of the war where it is down to the brute force of infantry because we haven't got that steel backing of the artillery that Montgomery was able to deploy in Normandy and later on in the campaigns. Even, even later on in the Italian campaign, there's more resources behind the spear that's the tip of the spear than there is at this point there it, it is often just infantry walking up hills against Correct. the suddenly defended germans and you know when we go to later in the war the amount of artillery we could bring to bear was just absolutely staggering and at this point you know as we know spike was in artillery but it wasn't it wasn't the force multiplier it was later in the war it's still it's still a 
important force, but it's just not, we haven't got that strength in depth, is basically what I'm saying. Absolutely. And famously, in that battle for the high points, the fogs deployed and charged with bayonets, with, uh, with brain guns being fired from the hip, shouting Fogabola like they were still in the Peninsula War. Uh, it was amazing. I think it was the last time when they were, you know, it's the old, give them the old cold steel. Anyway, that's a photograph of Tanguchen then, and this is a photograph in the next slide of Tanguchen now. Uh, again, with my brother walking towards it. So you can go up there, and, and it looks exactly the same. You can see all the features that were there. And then uh, this photograph is me at the top of Tanguchen, which was taken by the skins after much fighting. Uh, that's me looking very pleased with myself. And then the view from Tanguchen, which I think is very uh, educative, if that's mm. the right word. You get to the next slide. You can see why these hills had to be taken. That's Longstop Hill. So that's what you know they were trying to take back in December and couldn't take it because of, but the, 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 this is the view from Tanguchen and beyond Longstop is the main road. So these places had to be taken. Once that was done, Longstop fell immediately. And once that was down, then the ground was set for the final attack, which was that the, the Irish Brigade were then taken out of the front line at that point. And um, the outskirts of Tunis were taken, I think reached on the 7th. And on the 8th, of, this is a, just a brilliant photograph for anybody who loves the Irish Brigade, is that on the 8th of uh, April 1943, the Irish Brigade were the first marching troops to enter Tunis, and they were given a tumultuous welcome. The gentleman in front there, I think that is Lieutenant Michael Tasker. And the reason why I mention him, if you saw uh, the, the the house, House Through Time, it's a British program, people yeah, would know yeah, it. Yeah. He was mentioned. We think that's Michael Tasker. One of the things that we love to do is get a name these the, these these men yeah. in these photographs. We know we've been to that spot. You can do it then and now. You can walk there and it looks exactly the same. But who are and these just guys? For the, for the people who just aren't aware of this, for the uniform aficionados, the, the Irish units generally pull the beret or corbine down to the left, the, the same way the French would, not the right, the way the regular British regiments were. Uh, can I correct you? Can I correct you? Honestly. The Corbyn was basically invented as a, uh, 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 for the London Irish, and then it became very popular and was worn by other Irish formations, including the Skins and the Fox. But the London Irish Rifles, because they were a rifle formation, was allowed to have the cap badge over the right oh, eye. Right, right. So that if you're firing your rifle, you haven't got the Corbyn in your way. It's a unique concession. So as you can see, you can always tell a London Irish Rifles person by the way they wear the Corbyn. And that's a London Irish rifle. In there coming, there's a series of photographs. And noticeably, you'll see that the people greeting them are mainly, mainly uh, French settlers. Mm. Um, anyway, next. Uh, this photograph is taken in one of these. This is Major Zal Uh There are Irish Brigade members in five Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries. Uh, and they're all beautifully attended. You know all about that. Yeah. But yeah. We, we paid our respects to these places. And the next slide is, uh, this is a great, I mean, this is one of the great messages sent in British military history. It goes up with England expects, you know, Nelson said England expects. This is Harold Alexander, commander of the 18th. And uh, this is after, what is it? Since, I mean, it's more than it's two and a half years of fighting in North Africa. They've gone from Gates of Cairo, Casablanca, and involved hundreds of thousands, I think a million men, huge casualties after this incredible campaign. Uh, on the 13th of May, once Van Manu had surrendered, this message was sent to uh, Churchill and it is, uh, is my duty to report the Tunisian campaign is over. All enemy resistance has ceased. We are masters of the North African shores. Full stop, signed H.R. Alexander. What an amazing message. Uh, uh, a classic. It's a tiddly of, bit understated, I think, really, but yes. it's a Classic English understatement. It, it really is one of the great statements, you know, after this, this incredible battle. Uh, the future of British Empire at, at stake, and this is how it ends. So uh, I think it's around a quarter of a million. If you go to the next slide, around a quarter of a million German Axis troops taken prisoner. It was a bigger bag by far than the number that the Soviets took in Stalingrad. Yeah. Uh, they were all left behind by Hitler. He said, just fight to the end. You haven't got any petrol or you've got any ammunition. And the fighting continued for um, you know about a week, I don't know, seven, six, seven days after uh, Tunis was taken. Now, this photograph is just a wonderful one. You can see, you go to YouTube, and there's a wonderful newsreel count i don't know what formation i think it's the guards that's the guards, um, the guards isn't it? yeah, yeah 20,000 24,000 allied troops marched through the center of tunis and the this uh, the, the salute was taken by um 
Eisenhower Giraud and by Anderson. Anderson. These are the ones who took the salute, 24,000. And my dad was one of them. Can't see me in that photograph, but my dad was one of the 24,000 and he did a subsequent parade. parade. It, was, um, it, it was his first, I mean, six months. I mean, he's, he, he'd learned his lesson. I think some of the, you know, as time took on, as it, time went by and he lost more and more of his friends and had more and more close shaves, his feeling about all this, but I think he had a real thrill about being on this parade. It seemed like, you know, the, and the weather was beautiful. And you can walk down that street now and you can see all the same places and press on. And I come into the final clause. You can't finish this story without referring to this man. <laughs> because at this point, after all this, uh, the 78th Division was, uh, and the young Irish were transferred to the 8th Army and found their commander was Bernard. Uh, I don't know if he had his knighthood by this point. Uh, General Bernard Montgomery. There he is with his two caps on. And um, one of the things he did, one of the first things he did, uh, was to go out and address the troops and I preserved this conversation that my father remembers because right. he was there in the ranks uh, they were being prepared uh, in, in near Hammamet in Tunisia they were being prepared for the next one which is Sicily so they were going to sail from uh, from there to Sicily and Montgomery showed up and he did his typical showed up in his staff car and he said gather around everybody you know, and everybody broke ranks they all came around that was his specialism and he stand there funny little guy uh, and he so he's and and you can see this is the Irish Brigade, right? And the thing is about Montgomery, which I think everybody's aware of. Not only is Montgomery, well, Alexander was born in Ireland. Uh, Brooke was Irish. Uh, General Keatley, who was the commander of the Seventy Eighth Division, was, was Irish. And Montgomery, the Irish come uh, the number of Anglo Irish or Irish origin sol uh, soldiers in senior positions of the British Army at every stage in the Second World was really quite considerable. Montgomery was born. It came from a family from Mobile which is just across the border from uh, the Irish border, in Don uh, from between the county London Derry, or Derry, and Donegal. You go up the uh, Loch Foyle, one of the most beautiful parts of Ireland, and there's Moville, and that's where his father had been a bishop. So Montgomery was born, uh, well, he wasn't born in Ireland, he was actually born in Kensington, and his father, but he, he deemed himself to be an Anglo-Irishman, someone who was Irish at heart. Montgomery was a, an, an a French Anglo-Irish name. And he gathered them all around, he saw that it was the Irish Brigade, he saw I got a you know, these are my guys, I'm going to give them a few words. So he said, he asked the question, my father recorded this, he said, where do the best soldiers come from? Classic Montgomery question. And so everybody in the, in the ranks said, Ireland! And um, Montgomery said, well, from what part? And one boy shouted out, Derry! Or London Derry. Yeah, yeah. And Montgomery said, you're right. It's just down the road from where he came from. Anyway, so that was setting the scene for the next part of this story. And if you go to the final slide, there are a couple of films which, uh, on a lighter note, Casablanca was was given its premiere on the 24th of November 1942. Uh, as I think, what is that, eight, um, 26, 16 days after Operation Torch, so after Casablanca was get, captured. So the Hollywood star, uh, Hollywood accelerated the premiere of Casablanca to mm. take advantage of the interest. It's an amazing, is that a coincidence that the Hollywood's making a film with Bogart, one of the biggest stars? At exactly the same time as the US government was preparing <laughs> to take Casablanca. I don't know, but you know, conspiracy theories. But this is one of my favorite Second World War films. And I think the reason why I enjoy it is it's very well written. And it's got David Niven, and he's rarely in a bad film. Um, but this depicts the experiences of a of an infantry formation battalion in the Tunisian campaign. And in so many ways, it does things like it shows the kit, the training. Uh, their tactics, the way they were kind of led, and it was filmed in Algeria in 1944. And look at that cast. And one of the most amazing things about this cast is John Laurie. And at the end of this film, the scene at the end of the film with the this battalion advancing through smoke against German opponents was actually used as the end of Das Army. Yeah, they, the they borrowed the film. same scene. They borrowed, they? And, yeah, and, yeah. And, John, and John Laurie is in both. What a tribute. But it's very entertaining. Both films it is, are. and it, and it was made with the backing of the British government. It was a, it was yeah. it was it was both for a cinema release, but it was also kind of a you know morale boosting, propaganda kind of recruitment issue as well. It was, I think Trevor Howard was a naval guy in the ship as well. I think it was he was. Trevor Howard's, uh, it was film. his first appearance, uncredited. And, great, great and when, film. And at the end, because it, 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 it starts off with that typical kind of understated. There's some comedy moments, and they're all adjusting to army life, and the, and this seriousness kind of cranks up slowly but surely until you get towards the end and um yeah J jimmy hanley who's not the greatest actor is very good in it isn't he? he's um 
I guess he's probably better known as the father of what, what was his Jen, Jenny Hamley. Jeremy, Jeremy Hamley, chairman of the Conservative Party, yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah you look at that cast. Film. Good Pete film. Yeah, and, and around the American, well, Sheldrake is reminding because it was called the Immortal Battalion on the other side of the Atlantic. The way ahead for us, the Immortal Battalion on the other side um, of, the, of the Atlantic. So, well, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. I have a couple of questions for you and um, uh, similar things to what I mentioned to Sam. Yes, one is, is you, you've studied this and we can, we can have you back and talk about Sicily if you'd like to come on when we do a Sicily show. Very much, very happy to do that. Why do we think the fighting in Tunisia is just not quite as well known as as I mean Sicily is is much better now. I'm thinking of film, you know, films like Patton, which kind of just apart from Casserine Pass, you're Bradley there looking at it, and then it goes boom straight to Sicily, isn't it? You don't get Tunis. I don't always Tunis in it briefly. I can't remember now. But why why do you think Tunisia doesn't get the the acclaim? Well, I well. He, I've talked to Tunisians about it, and uh, there's a historian there, and he said, "Well, in Tunisia, this is very important, isn't it? It's the local, it's the local memory. You know, like France, there's a memory of this. You can argue about it, but there is a memory, and Italy, exactly the same. There is a memory. You can dispute it, uh, and 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 in Soviet Union and uh, Russia and everywhere else, and Poland, in Tunisia, the for the local population, around sixty thousand of Tunisians died in this from starvation, disease." And from actual being, uh, uh, he said nobody nobody knows any of it. Nobody knows any of it. There's no record of it. And I think the the key to this is that immediately after the the Tunisian campaign, French control, colonial control. So the French over, influence disappears eventually, doesn't it? Yeah. No, no, but they, well, they, it was restored. It was a state. It's a status quo oriented campaign. Uh, the Allies wanted to strike a blow against the Axis, uh, not Vichy at the war, maybe, um, end the war in North Africa, but they were also aware they didn't want to destabilize French colonial control of these three huge countries. And so they were they they allowed the French system to be restored. And you've got to remember that France, Algeria was part of metropolitan France. I mean, if you were born in Algeria, you're French, you weren't Algerian. Mm. And Morocco and Tunisia were protectorates, basically con uh, colonial controlled. And immediately after this campaign, French colonial control was restored. And this produced another response, which on, went on until 1962, in which there was escalating nationalist resistance to French control, which culminated in eventually George, Charles de Gaulle becoming president of France yeah, yeah. and granting independence, uh, uh, independence to the Algerians. So I think partly it's because this particular campaign didn't seem to have quite the noble outcome that you can associate with the liberation of Paris, the liberation of Rome that my father yeah, was I in. Mean, I, I can just speak from my point of view of living in France. If I go to a big bookshop with lots and lots of military history books, there's nothing in there about Tunisia, even from the, you know from the from the French point of view. From the French, you know, you were saying that it was it was French people there lining the streets in Tunis. There's yeah. There's there's nothing about it. Yeah, Algeria, Algeria, I suppose to some extent is part of it. And again, that's kind of the, the colonials and the, the revolution and all that kind of stuff. The, the, but but Tunisia is a World War II campaign. I, I don't remember ever seeing a book about it here. I've got I've got Cedric Mass, a French historian, coming on in France at War Week. He's talking about Bir Hakim in in North Africa. I might ask him about because yeah, he, he's a French politician as well as being a writer. What he feels. The French, why there isn't the French interest in Tunisia? Um, is it the Vichy thing? I mean, it's, it's weird because we, I'm going to go from a tangent, but when we did the shows about the French occupation, resistance, and Vichy, honestly, if I go and switch my TV on in France now, I pretty much guarantee I'll find a documentary about the French Vichy regime. They, they went for years of kind of not acknowledging the French part of the roundups and the Vichy part of it. And now you just switch on, and there's, there's, there'll be one on. There'll be a documentary on about you know france's darkest hour so to speak so but tunisia just doesn't seem to have come up but um yeah it's fascinating and um but yeah if you will come back on and sit and talk about that but you know the other thing i want to just ask you about briefly is about clearly it's about visiting the ground i mean you can sit and read the the, the old official pre just post-war regimental histories but the maps are normally pretty ropey in those things and Clearly, your understanding of this has gone from visiting those bits of high ground and those valleys and putting it all together just by seeing it. Absolutely. I mean, could have done the job without Ian Mitchell's help because what some of the high points we were trying to locate, the maps were really hopeless. We really didn't know where it was. 
Uh, and Ian Mitchell had done a lot of uh, groundwork, and that appears in his book, uh, Battle of the Peaks. Uh, and we had to actually do uh, some of the, we, we actually identified, uh, I, I re identified some of the high points and gave them the proper location. Uh, so, but I, it's a fabulous place to visit because not only can you do the battlefields, but you've also got historic Tunisia, you've got Carthage, you've got these incredible Roman and Greek uh, Roman remains. And it's got a great history and the people are you know typically warm and friendly uh, obviously it's uh, it depends on the guidance but uh, the british embassy is actually very uh, very encouraging he wants mm -hmm. more people uh wants more people to uh, uh british people to come and focus on this because this is a moment in which there is a sort of common interest between the british and the tunisians uh, yeah. but um uh, richard my brother is posting things if anybody wants any help on doing a visit i it's actually very cost effective. We stayed in a very good hotel in Tunisia, which had been used in the Second World War as the German HQ. What are they based there? You can stay in the hotel, um, and it was extremely good value. And you can hire a car. You can get to the, the to to the high points that we visited, probably all the main ones, in about an hour, and you can walk the ground. Oh, and you can get this. Uh, you, you need a probably need a guide, and somebody who knows their way around, and someone who can speak Arabic as well as French. Because once you get up to the high ground, then you'll find that people speak in Arabic, not French. Um, but it's really rewarding. We've had a wonderful time there. And we can also recommend a very good local historian who's more than willing to help. Well, brilliant. Well, it gives a good point, again, to remind the fact that the, 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 link, the link to your website is in the description below, and they can contact you via that and read more about these, these campaigns and your brother. And um, from my point of view, it's been absolutely fantastic. So I'll just remind you, we've got one more show coming up tomorrow. I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So tomorrow, as I said earlier, we're talking about an Italian victory in 1941 with Giulio, who runs the incredible Italian Military Archives uh, website. So another kind of website owner coming on. Uh, to talk about us, to talk about to us. But um, right now, it means me to say thank you very much to Edmund or Eddie for joining us. And yeah, I will hold you to your uh, promise of coming back and doing Sicily. I will do a Sicily week next year, probably coincide, coinciding with the anniversary, uh, you know, the month, I, I guess. I don't know. I haven't thought about it yet, but I will definitely have you on for that. And viewers, thanks for staying with us. And um, we will see you all again tomorrow. So this is Paul Woodhead from World War II TV saying thank you again. I will see you all again tomorrow. Thanks. It's been great. Wonderful.